to be honest, I found an 11-year-old boy, and I had him run it. It's truly that simple. I had some things I had to take care of, so I called Asher over, and he just lit up and clicked away. Uh, there's plenty of needs that can so easily be filled if you want to go deeper than just sitting and listening. Uh, give you a couple uh, more announcements before we get into what I truly love, God's Word. Uh, first one is round table next week. I'm sorry we don't have a slide for the visual uh, learners, um, but round table is a time in which we get together, and you can tell by the symbol of round table, right? We sit face to face and we talk about this church. One, we're a congregational run church, but even more so, we are the church. And so we love to have these gatherings to let anybody who wants to know more about this community, what is happening. And based on the growth of everything that's happening down here, there's a lot of changes coming, that's coming our way with positions and full-time and just all these different things. And so we want to let you guys know about that. So next week, after our second service, we'll have a roundtable. Uh, the second opportunity I want to let you know about is a chance to serve God through loving on kids. So VBS... June 3rd through June 6th. I think we got a slide for that, Josh. Um, it's up at the main campus. And if you have a desire to just love on people, kids are the easiest people to do that with, right? They actually pour more into the volunteers than you can pour into them. And so they're kind of looking for people that are willing and interested, I guess, even more so interested to step in and just hang out with kids for three hours a day, four or five days uh, for that week. Um, and I think it's uh, kindergarten through fifth grade. So just a beautiful age. Now, if you have any questions about that, come and talk to me or go onto our website. You'll see a lot of stuff there. All right, so now I get the opportunity to uh, just teach you more about the God of the Bible through the Bible. Therefore, like always, we got to stop and go to God to just invite him into our minds because the Spirit is the only one that can bring us anything of lasting value. So please, if nothing else, silence your mind with me. God, we acknowledge right now your reality and your power over us, and we give you open access to our minds and our hearts, asking that you would give us truth, that you would lead us into what we need to know so that way we can better live, so that way we can better love other people and better glorify you. Spirit, you have total access to our hearts. Your will be done. Amen. Okay, so last week we started a three-week series that we've entitled, We Are His Church. During this time, we're going to be using Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21, as a launching point to examine an important question that every single follower of, G of Jesus should be asking themselves. And not just once, but continually asking themselves, what is the church? Specifically for us, what should Rimrock downtown be? So before I get into my thoughts, let's get into our, the passage that we're looking at, Ephesians 3. If you've got a Bible, please flip or scroll to it. Ephesians 3, verses 14 and on. This is Paul writing. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we all ask or imagine. To him be in... To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Like we talked about last week, when something is as normal a part of your life and therefore really important to you, something that you're willing to commit your time, your effort, and your money to, right? which for most of us I would say is church, if something is that worthwhile, it is necessary for us to take time to examine why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now, it, clearly state, it was clearly stated in the title of this message, but in case you didn't catch it or you weren't here last week, let me plainly state the starting point for our group processing of this question. Of this question, what is the church? It is us. Right? It is the people that have chosen to put their faith in the reality of the God of the Bible. 
Like I tell you over and over in the New Testament, church was never seen as a building or even as an organization. Rather, it was always referring to the community of followers of Jesus. So we are his church. With that common starting point, like last week, we began to use Ephesians 3 to answer the question of exactly what, or better said, we are supposed to be. And we went into verse 17 to discover the fertile soil out of which we can flourish as a community. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Like it plainly states in the two verses that follow this, as a community, we must be continually and only rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. Like we saw last Sunday, this love is bigger than life. And just like Paul described it, it surpasses knowledge or beyond our ability to truly understand. And we have small and feeble minds that have so much trouble grasping the magnitude of the love of Jesus. The fact that he made us, that he saved us, and he is the one sustaining our life every single day is hard for us to understand. And the sad thing is, it's even hard for us to remember as we live this life. So right now, let me bring you back to this foundational truth. Without the love of God, we would have absolutely nothing. And I'm not talking metaphorically. I mean literally nothing. You, me, this world, nothing. Even if he did make us, without him stepping into our brokenness, we would be locked into our own misery, chained to this, our own selfish destruction. As a community, those, anyone who wants to be a part of Rimrock Downtown, we must be continually going back to these facts. That Jesus loved us to the point of creating us and our beautiful world. And then he gave us a way out of the darkness that we brought into his perfect creation. But his love for us, it isn't only past tense. He continues to demonstrate his powerful love by providing us with life every day. Now, for anyone that wants to be a part of this community, this is what we must be continually bringing our minds back to, the love of Jesus. Our mantra as a church needs to be what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. This is one of my favorite verses, especially when it's talking about the church and our mindset. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14. For the love of Christ urges us on. Another translation, it says the love of Christ compels us because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. This is the primary answer for the question that we are pondering, what is the church? It is a community that is firmly rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. As we continue to answer this guiding question this morning, I want to stay with the analogy of soil. As we all know, soil is an essential part of the life of a plant. Without it, the seed wouldn't receive the protection and the nutrients that it needs in order to stay alive. But a seed wasn't meant to only be a seed, was it? Within that tiny shell is an incredibly well-designed set of DNA that will allow the seed to develop into a flower or a shrub or a tree or whatever that it was designed to be. This is why it needs a soil. So that way the organism can turn into whatever it was, turn into exactly what it was created to be. This is the same reason why we need the love of Christ. So that we, so that way you and me can become more and more like the people that you were made to be. Take a moment to ponder that statement. The primary reason that the love of Jesus exists is so that way our lives can be made better. This speaks volumes about what love is meant to be. Selfless, which means focused on others, and generous, just pouring out goodness into other people. In 1 John 4, 8, it states that God is love. Not that God has love or that God is loving, but God is love. That means that if we want to know the definition of love, what can we do? We can look to God and see the ways that he acts. If we do, then we'll begin to understand what love truly is. And a major way in which God interacts with the people that he made is by always wanting to make our lives better. He did this through giving us an incredible world to live on and beautiful bodies to live in. He also did this by stepping into our reality and dying a sacrificial death on our behalf. And like we'll focus in on this morning, 
He is also showing us his love by guiding and empowering us to become the best versions of ourselves possible. Now, I love the way, I love how clearly this is stated in Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are what he has made us. Other translations, we are his handiwork, we are his workmanship, we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. I'm a logical man. Right? My mind continually goes back to asking questions and finding log- logical answers. Maybe you can relate. Right? With the train of thought presented in Ephesians 2.10, the idea of God guiding us into the life that he has prepared for us, my mind always lands on, what better way could there be for me to live other than the way that I was created to live? Right? Think about this with anything that you own and rely on your phone, your car, your house, whatever. How do we want each of these crucial things to operate? Exactly the way that they were made to operate. This means that logically the best way for you and me to live is how? The way that we were created to live, right? The way that God designed us. Now, out of his love for us, this is what God wants for us as well. This is why he created us. This is why he died for us, and this is also why he dwells within our hearts. So that way he can express his love for us by guiding and empowering us into the best lives possible. Now, I imagine it's safe to say that a lot of us in this room have spent a decent amount of time in church. And the phrases that I just rattled off may not have caught your attention, right? I'm in the exact same boat. When I hear something or see something repeated in many different ways, I become desensitized to whatever is trying to be communicated, but because I have your attention, well, most of your attention right now, right, I want to try to pull just one of those concepts, one of those truths out of the dusty corners of our minds and potentially help us see it in a new light. Let me start with the well-known and potentially desensitized phrase, asking Jesus to live in your heart. I imagine we've heard that before, right? Jesus, come live in my heart. You probably were told that if you grew up in the church as a child. Because of how common it has been declared and also how strange of a concept it is, sadly, this is something that is often never really considered by the followers of Jesus. But this is just as fundamental to our lives as Jesus dying on our behalf. Jesus has the ability to dwell within your heart. Now, because of who I am as a teacher, I got to ask you a potentially challenging question. As someone who has either placed their faith in Jesus or at least interested in him, do you know this? I mean, do you really know this? Is this something that you believe at the core of who you are and then operate out of day after day? The fact that Jesus, the creator of everything, the one who has power beyond our comprehension, that we have the ability to have the God of the universe live within the deepest parts of who we are. Do you know this? The reason that I'm being so adamant on this is because of how life-changing and how life-giving this truth is, but how common it is for it to be unknown or unaccepted by so many Christians. My hope for the next 20 minutes or so is to give you some biblical understanding of exactly what this means, to ask Jesus into your heart, and then to help answer that question that we're, we're looking to answer, what is the church? Now, as always with this community, let's go straight to the Bible so we can get universal truth. Now, we see this fact clearly stated in Ephesians 3, 16, and 17, kind of our ground verses. So verse 17, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It says it right there, as you are being rooted and grounded in love, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. So we know that this isn't something that a theologian or a fancy-speaking pastor one day just came up with this phrase, but this is coming directly out of the Bible. Now, because heart is another one of those overly used words that has become cliche and lost a lot of its meaning, it was really helpful for me, shoot, seven, eight years ago to look up a definition of what the biblical authors most likely meant when they said heart. Now, one definition I found, never the literal body part called the heart. 
This is a reference to the areas of the inner self, including the will, the mind, the desires, and emotions. This means that when Paul tells us in Ephesians 3 that Christ will dwell in your hearts, this means that the almighty maker of everything will dwell or live in or reside in the deepest and most authentic parts of who we are. Our will and our mind and our desires and our emotions are what make us. Right? Our body is a simple shell that houses our heart. Our heart is what drives us to do everything that we do, and this is where God can be. When we take the time to consider the power and the gravity behind that statement, it should be causing us to shake our heads saying, really? To help us go a little bit deeper in understanding, let me show you another passage. This time, it's from Jesus himself. It's going to be John 14. And if you want to just have a really good verses to ponder on of Jesus and kind of his like, desire for his disciples, John 13, 14, 15, 16 are just so, packed with so much. John 14, verses 15 through 20 for right now. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I will live, you will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, this gives us a little bit more context for this mind bender, right? It gives us an idea of who and the how behind what and can actually happen. Now, after Jesus did what he came to earth to do, to die on our behalf, he was brought back to life. 40 days later, he left earth and went back to his throne in heaven, but because he didn't want to leave his disciples alone, he promised to send them someone else. Now, depending on your translation, Jesus promised to send them the advocate, the helper, the comforter, the friend, or the counselor. Let's look a little bit closer at who this is that he is promising to send. Now, in these verses, Jesus used the title, the spirit of truth. This is a really important thing to recognize. The one that, he will be send, that Jesus will be sending to his followers after he leaves is the spirit. This is both a name and a descriptor. Right? The fact that it's capitalized, right? what does that mean? Come on, somebody has to know that. It's a proper noun, which means it's his name. So that's most likely where we get the title spirit or Holy Spirit from but it's also a word that lets us know who or what he is. In the Greek, the word spirit can mean a few different things, like breath or wind or an evil spirit or a person's inner being, like the heart, what we're talking about, or the Holy Spirit. But every single one of these are immaterial or non-tangible. They cannot be seen or touched. Now, this is a really important thing to know about the one that Jesus promised to send to his disciples. He is not a physical being. Because of that, our culture, the Western culture, the ways that we have been viewing the world for the past 250 years, it has ruled out the Holy Spirit's existence altogether. If we can't see it or touch it, then it must not be real. This way of seeing our reality, it's stemming from this worldview that we are only physical beings. Right, that we are no more than atoms and molecules that are attached to one another and they cling together as, much, as long as they can until we die. Now this is coming out of the scientific mindset that we only believe that what we can tangibly prove is real. Whether we believe this or not, this culture has been the underwriting current of so many things that we are presented with day after day. Major things like through media or academics or even sermons, right? especially from more conservative churches. Because of that, whether we know it or not, it has been extremely influential on the ways that we think about God and experience him. And there are so many flaws in this worldview. We, as in you and me and every other human being, we are more than just physical. I hope you agree with that wholeheartedly. Yes, we have incredible bodies that are made out of matter, but there's more to us than just what we can see and touch. Let me give you a quick thought to consider the general lack of discontentment in this world. 
Now, how many of you are content always? Right? Have you ever met a person that is always content? This is a battle that we are fighting against every day, really every moment of every day. If we were just physical beings, if once our physical needs were, needs were met, like hunger and thirst and shelter, then why would we not be content? Right? We have everything that we need to survive, therefore we are good. But we cannot get contentment just out of those things. Why not? Because we are made for more. We are more than just the physical. We also have a spiritual component within us. Like it says in Genesis 126, we're created in God's image. And one of the definitions of that has to be because he is spirit, therefore he has given us that same component. Now, I could give you a lot more examples that point to the fact that we are more than just physical, we are more than just physical, that we also have the spiritual. But my whole point in showing us this is that when Jesus said that the spirit of truth will come to you, when Paul says that Christ will dwell in your hearts or in your spirits, this isn't just a mythical way to try to encourage people that God is close. No, this is speaking to the legitimacy of God in his spiritual form, having the ability to inhabit us, our spiritual nature. To add a little bit more clarity to this, please notice what Jesus said in verse 20, John 14, 20. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, this is a little bit of a mind bender, but it shows us that there are three different parts to our God. The Father, Jesus, and the Spirit. They are in one another, which means that they are intimately connected and fully unified in everything that they do. So it doesn't mean that they are like physically or spiritually together, but they are unified in what they do. We see this in verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Catch this. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. The only reason that Jesus did anything that he did was because he was led by the Father to do it. But just because they are one, fully unified, doesn't mean that they don't take on three different forms. We have God the Father, right, who seems to be this incredible and uncontainable force. Think about Mount Sinai, God descending like an atomic bomb, and Moses wanting to see his glory, and God saying, no, no, I can't show you that. And then we have Jesus, who has a physical body, who can walk and talk and hang out with people just like us. And then we have the Spirit, Right, the third part of the Trinity that has the ability to make his home in the hearts of man. To show you that this actually happens, right, let me show you some examples from the Bible. And this is just a handful out of many. First one is with the judges. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord God raised up a deliverer for the Israelites who delivered them. Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave his enemies into his hands, right? First, the spirit of the Lord had to come upon him for any of that to happen. Check out 1 Samuel. This is with David. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brother, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And you guys are hopefully following where that spirit went, right, into his heart, into his willpower, into his emotions, into his mind, into everything that drove him to do what he was doing. This is why David was able to do what he did. Goliath is the next chapter after this. Right? And then we get to Jesus, the New Testament. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened up to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Do you guys know that Jesus had the Spirit of God intentionally come upon him the moment before he started his ministry? You guys know there's nothing noteworthy that we see that Jesus did prior to the Spirit of God coming upon him. Everything that follows after that we know of Jesus was after the Spirit of God inhabited his heart. Let's do one more with the disciples. I guess the apostles, technically. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Again, think about filled. That's their minds, their emotions, their willpower, the deepest parts of who they are. These are examples of the spirit of truth, God himself coming into real people. You know, I know Jesus was a bit different, but everybody else that we looked at, they are flawed, right? Imperfect, stumbling through life just like we do, and then, and still God came into the deepest parts of who they are. Now, from this position, he is able to be what Jesus described him as back in John 14, the advocate, the helper, the comforter, the friend, the counselor. Now, all these terms, they come from one Greek word, the parakletos, which is describing someone who comes alongside another to help them. I just love that definition. You want to know what the, who the Holy Spirit is? Someone who wants to come alongside you to help you. This means that the reason why Jesus is going to send his disciples the spirit of truth, just like we were thinking through earlier, it is out of his love for us. So that way he can help make our lives better. Really, be as good as they can possibly be. Now, even if you're tracking and you're understanding the unbel- this unbelievable part of our reality, you are probably still wondering, Evan, what does this look like? In what ways will the Spirit of God come alongside and help me? Now, the nice thing is if we flip to the two more chapters over in John, we see Jesus clearly describe this. John 16. And everything I'm giving you now is much more universal, big picture, just these truths that I really hope you go home and meditate on your own, right? It's not just kind of, well, he will do this, he will do this, but it's giving you ph- concepts, philosophies. Now, John 16, verses 7 and on. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And this is kind of where we get a description of what he'll do. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin. I think that's the translation I have in there. But I found it much better. Another one that says, and when he comes, he will convict the world about sin and judgment and righteousness, righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been contemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I say to you that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Spirit of God, the one who can make his home in our hearts, right? he has the ability to convict and guide us. Right? From that intimate position deep within us, he can point out when we are doing those things that we know we shouldn't be doing. Whether we're about to do it or we've already done it. You guys know that feeling I'm talking about? Right? It's saying that he is an instrument of that conviction to point out, man, I don't want you to go down that path because it's only going to lead to hardship for you. And I love you, and I don't want to see you do that. Instead, let me guide you into what is real, what will bring you life, what will help make your life exactly what we all want it to be. You know, I've shown you a lot of concepts, but I feel like it's important for me to give you just a couple examples of times in which I feel, and I say that word intentionally, I feel like it was the Holy Spirit. The first one is with conviction. Back when I was young and dumb, I was a full-fledged pothead, right? And I remember a time when I was 16 or so. It was a Friday after school, going up to a friend's parents' house. They were out of town, and our plan was just to get completely stoned. But on my way up to that house, I remember this gut-wrenching feeling within my stomach. I could not get past it. It was like almost causing me to bend over. But I just pushed through it. It It's like, you know what, whatever, it'll go away. I'm going to ignore it. And sure enough, it did go away. And I continued to go about doing what I want to do and got high as a kite. But in co- looking back upon this, right, in the, having more, of, more hindsight 2020, I'm, I'm at the point where I firmly believe that the Spirit was trying to be like, Evan, don't do that. 
Do not continue to worship that false idol. He will lead you to nothing but destruction. Instead, turn back to me. You know me. We have a relationship. Come back to me. And because I said, you know, I don't want you, I think out of his love for me, he said, fine, Evan, I'm going to let you go down the path that you want to go down. And so he didn't bring that conviction around for years and years after that point. You know, but he's not only there to convict us. He's also there in, to guide us into all truth. So let me give you another one. And this was only a couple of weeks back. You know, we own a lodge up by Mount Rushmore, a bunch of cabins, and now's our rental season. And I wanted to do a little bit of work, and I'm quite confident in what I can do with a mini excavator, right? Confident enough to get myself into trouble. And so as I was digging deep, guess what I hit? A septic line right? All 11 cabins and everything in them flow into that septic line. And we're about a week away from opening up, actually three days. It was on a Tuesday. I opened up on that Friday. And because of all the underground water, it was just this mucky mess, right? Just crazy. Couldn't see anything. I ended up having to quit for the day. And as I was driving away, I was fully filled with fear, right? To the point where at three o'clock that next morning, I woke up just overwhelmed by, oh man, what kind of trouble am I in? But in that mess, Right? A, a verse kept coming back to my mind, and it came through a song. Shane and Shane sang, uh, sang Psalms 34, and in that it says that uh, I cried out the, to the Lord, and he answered me, and he saved me from all my troubles. And that line kept repeating in my head over and over as I lay in bed. And so I was like, fine, I'll get up. I went and started a fire, started meditating on that verse, and this thought came to me. It's like, why don't I cry out to God? And so I cried out to God. Guess what came to my mind the moment after? Two names, Seth and Dan Lundy, people of our church that do this professionally. So I called them at 8 a.m. They were out at my place at 10 a.m. By 2 p.m., everything was taken care of. And yes, you can say, well, Evan, come on. That was probably just your thoughts and random firings of emotions and maybe some indigestion. That, and it's like, no way, right? You can think that way if you want, or I can analyze this and say, man, the God of the Bible says to cry out to him and he will save me from all my troubles. When I did, I was saved. So how else can I imagine that took place if it wasn't the spirit of God working within me? Now, I know there's a lot of questions and there should be about what is the spirit of God versus what is my emotions? What is my indigestion, right? That's the importance of seeing that he is a spirit of truth. You need to always check what he's telling you to do with the Bible. He will never give you anything that is outside of the truth of the Bible. Now, the reason I give you those everyday examples is because it's important for us to know that God is wanting and able to work within you in small, everyday ways. So that way, out of his love for you, he can help you become more and more of who he created you to be. Now, the Bible's term for this is sanctification which means that the God of the Bible is transforming us, remaking us, refining us. Now, I love how clearly it states this in 2 Corinthians verse 3. It shows us that this is the role of the Spirit. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord specifically the Spirit. This means that the main reason that the Spirit dwells within the hearts of men is so that way he can transform us. So that way he can make us better, renew us, help us grow into what we're designed to be. And because of the power that God has, he can bring about changes within you that you would never have believed possible. I think this is exactly why Paul says what he says in our main verses, Ephesians 3, verse 20. And now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. You know, I think often, sadly, people think that I'll be able to raise people from the dead or heal individuals, right? I'll have like superhuman powers coming from my fingers. But what I'm seeing this as is much more of the ways in which the spirit can change our hearts, can break us free of addiction and bondage that we never imagined we could be free from. Now, what I just gave you was a flyover of the Bible's teachings on the Holy Spirit, of who he is and what he wants you to do. My hope, as always, is that you take this and you go home and you study this on your own. That's why I'm giving you so many Bible verses, so that way you can do what I do every week. 
And the amount of time that I'm able to put into studying, that corresponds directly with how much my life is changed. So please take some time on your own to get into these verses. If you have questions on it, contact me. I would love to help you better understand this. You know, before we get to application, which we'll do a little bit of that, um, I want to quickly, I want to point out another quick point of how the Spirit is able to do all of this. You know, in the passages that we've been looking at in John, the reason why Jesus is telling his disciples who will come to him after he leaves is because he's about to die. He's only hours away from being crucified. This means that the only reason that we can receive the holy or perfect spirit into our hearts is because of what Jesus did for us on that cross. While he was hanging on that brutal Roman cross, God the Father placed the sins of the entire world on the shoulders of his son. So that way, after his death, because of his death, anyone who places their faith in that sacrificial act, they can be forgiven and their hearts can be cleansed. I love the way that Peter puts it. 1 Peter chapter 2. So many verses that you can choose to show this. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that us, free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That's speaking of your heart. Your heart, your broken heart has been put back together. It has been made new. And with a clean heart, guess who's allowed to live inside of there? Our perfect God. So you know what this means for our guiding question of what is the church? Who should Rimrock Downtown be? It means that every single person who has called upon the name of the Lord to be saved has the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, living within them. It's not the pastor Right? It's not the people up front, it's not the priest or the cardinal or any of these individuals that only have God in his power, but it is every single believer. Now, I know that people have different beliefs on when this will happen, but from what I see throughout the entire Bible, not proof te- texting by grabbing one verse and saying, oh, I'll see what it says here, but the entire Bible, the moment that anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, they also receive his spirit. You don't have to be a part of a certain type of church. You don't have to say a certain type of prayer. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be anointed by some oil. Right? Out of God's intense love for us, the instant that we are forgiven and our hearts are made clean, he comes within us. He inhabits us. He takes that place as a paracletes, that comforter, that counselor, so that way he can guide us into his truth. This means that every person within our community that follows Jesus, that we have that within us. And for us, that should do at least two things, right? The first one, it should be extremely encouraging. It should give you hope. He is continually, every day, every moment of every day, fighting that battle within you to make you more of who he wants you to be. So hang on to hope with that sin that you struggle with, whatever it might be. It could be addiction to alcohol or drugs or porn. It could be greed. It could be self-centeredness. It could be just this feeling that you are worthless. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, the Spirit of God is wanting to just chip away at that rock in order to turn you into who he wants you to be. So please hang on to hope. You don't have to act a certain way. You don't even have to live a certain way for the Spirit of God to be within you. You can never remove him from you by simply sinning too much. The second thing that we gotta be hanging on to with this, applying to our lives, is that we can be empowered as a community to do things that are beyond what we can even imagine. Think about the reality of God himself living within all of us or most of us. As a church, think about what he could then do with us, through us, in the heart of the city. He gave us this building for reasons. And the fact that he is living within us should give us this like excitement of the power of what we're gonna get to see him do through us. But such an important thing, really crucial thing that we have to know with this whole equation is if we want him to be able to refine us, 
to free us from those addictions, those sinful tendencies that we have. If we want him to empower us to accomplish things that are beyond our wildest dreams as a community, we first have to die to ourselves. It's not until we are willing to do that that the spirit has the ability to move within us. You know, an important, even interesting, important, whatever, truth or thought that was given to me this week was that because the Spirit and Jesus are one, like we saw in John, the Spirit will never act in ways that we didn't see Jesus act. This means that the Spirit will never force you to do his will. Just like with Jesus, just like Jesus did with his disciples and those who who surrounded him, he will counsel you and he will gently lead you down the right path, but he will never overpower you and your will and make you follow him. This means that if we want to first hear the Spirit and then have the ability to follow Him and be changed by Him, we must first turn away from all the clutter in our mind and the chaos that we're surrounded by in our culture and then intentionally turn to Him and say, man, I want and I need to hear from you. It's only when we're willing to silence our selfishness that we will be able to hear God speak to us. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this like through everyday praying. Try starting every day before you even get out of bed with praying. Opening up your mind and your life, whatever lies ahead of you, to God. Inviting him in. This also comes through reading his word. Daily get in the word. Even if it's for five minutes, right? There's so many apps that can set you those reminders. Get in his word in order to silence everything else and hone you in on what is true. True. Also surround yourself with other people like this because God not only speaks to our minds, but he speaks to us through other people and we have to get in community for that to happen. Listen to music. There's so many different ways you can do it, right? Even just sitting in the silence. Think about it. How often in our age of technology do you sit in just stillness? Maybe never, right? But try that out. Turn your phone off, put it away, and just sit somewhere for 10 minutes with nothing else around you. If we do this, then the Spirit has the ability to move within us. But such an important piece to know with all of this, all of these disciplines only work if we're doing them in order to surrender to God. Not to become smarter at the Bible or be really good at singing songs or just become this deep philosopher, but the core of all of it is like, God, I give you my mind. I give you my willpower. I give you my heart. It's if and only if we do this will we then be able to see the Spirit do what He has to do. You know, to give you kind of a bit of a visual, right, analogy, the metaphor, I guess, um, with the soil, what must happen to a seed in order for it to turn into what it was created to be? It must die. The seed itself, right, its crusty shell must be broken open if it will turn into what it was designed and created to be. And we also get another symbol, much more powerful than that picture. Uh, It's communion. So we got a stage up here and two in the back. And as you come up, you can just grab it however you want. I encourage you to take it back to your seat and do some reflection on what this is showing. Right? Think about how sacrificial Jesus was to his father in doing what he did on that cross. The way that he truly died to everything within him that didn't want that to happen. And he said, Father, into your hands I give my spirit. And as you reflect on that, think about your own life. Think about your own state before God. And I strongly encourage you to take this moment to once again surrender to the spirit of God the one that is within you and allow him to move however he needs to move within your heart. 